Find out how Mile High Taxi runs at more than 350 frames per second on my gaming machine. Today I'm going to talk about performance in Unity, including how I managed greater than 60 frames per second and more than 30 FPS on a low-end Intel UHD 620 integrated graphics card. Hello, this is Cassius, creator of Mile High Taxi. For those of you that have been following my progress, you may have noticed over the last few devlogs that I've been changing up the format a little as I try and find a comfortable groove. Today I'm trying yet another approach in this special edition episode. Rather than just listing off a bunch of boring changes I've made to the game since the last devlog, I figured I'd show how I'm doing things, not just what I'm doing. My hope is that some of you watching this can point out how I can do things better. Or perhaps, others can take inspiration from my strategies. Let's get started. I'm always striving to shave off a millisecond here and there in a never-ending quest to optimize performance in Mile High Taxi. If you are a Unity developer, you've probably heard of Amplify Imposter. If not, it's basically a tool to transform distant 3D objects into 2D images to save on system resources. I picked it up on sale a week ago and started trying it out with my game. While the tool is great, and I do recommend it, Imposter was actually costing me more resources than saving me, so I ended up not using it for this game. I won't go into the reasons right now. Instead, I'll show you a bit of how I'm currently optimizing the game, and why it ended up being more performant that way. But before that, swing on over to Steam and wishlist Mile High Taxi if you haven't already. The link is below. To help me optimize, I picked up two new computers from Dell. The first is a high-end productivity machine for game data. Unfortunately, I somehow mistook inches in the product description for centimeters and was very surprised at how big it was when it arrived. The second is a low-end laptop that I can performance test against. Thankfully, it's much smaller. There are tens of thousands of game objects in Mile High Taxi, if not hundreds of thousands. I already knew that when I started working on the game in December of 2019. I would have to heavily rely on Unity's occlusion calling system to help me out. Taking that into account when I modeled the buildings in Blender, I only modeled between 6 and 12 floors per building. Since all my buildings are four-sided with 90 degree angles, I only needed to model one face for each. Well, technically two or three since each face also got higher LOD levels as well. Then I added the mesh into Unity, copying the single face four times, rotating each by 90 degrees. This was then made into a prefab. However, not all buildings will have four sides visible. There are plenty of buildings that are right beside each other. And that's where this image comes in. So if you pretend you're looking at these from the tops of the buildings, top down here, the thick lines are the fully modeled mesh and the thin lines are the same as the low quality LOD levels. You can see what I mean here, where two sides of the building are higher quality and the other two are very low. Once that's all set up, I replicate those floors vertically and made a new prefab of that too. Okay, done. After routing the buildings into the scene in Unity, I baked the occlusion color and ended up with this. Notice how Unity only renders the parts of the buildings that would be visible to the camera and not the entire buildings? Whereas if those buildings were single objects, the vertice count would nearly double, even with baked occlusion color. On top of all this, and I haven't shown this in the video, but as buildings get further away, they convert into a simple cube. In terms of numbers and statistics, it's the difference between 22 million triangles, 28,000 draw calls, and about 20 frames per second, versus 1.2 million triangles, 3,800 draw calls, and over 200 frames per second. If you are not using occlusion calling, you should. Of course, if every segment on a non-occluded building incurred 
its own draw call or set pass, this would be a significant problem. That's why I decided to atlas the textures for the buildings. All the buildings you see throughout the entire game are using one of just four 8K materials. By the way, I'm using the Universal Render Pipeline, or URP. If you are interested in setting up atlasing for your project, I used M8 Texture Atlaser on GitHub. It was a bit finicky to work with, but it's free. A moment ago I mentioned low quality LOD levels use a single cube for the building. Those all share a single low quality material. That's for every building in the game. Anyways, having so many buildings share a single material means I can implement one of many batching options. For now, static batching isn't one of them, mostly. For my game, it completely blows the RAM budget with something around 20 gigabytes of mesh and memory. My memory budget is 4 gigabytes for everything. That's not to say I won't revisit it in the future when I have a more clean way of disabling unnecessary game objects. In fact, I do use static batching for higher LOD levels that consist of very few triangles. But for now, statically batching the rest is cost prohibitive. But back to atlasing. It's not just the buildings I've atlased. I have about 130 unique billboards that all share a single atlas material, as do my street signs as well. Right now, all my material textures take up less than 2 gigabytes of memory, and last time I checked, mesh was under 100 megabytes. Awesome. So I'm mostly talking about the buildings, but obviously a lot of this applies to my dynamic game objects as well. I found that using dynamic batching put too much pressure on the CPU when it was even possible. So instead, I opted to group together a bunch of dynamic objects that were close to each other and set up a collision trigger for the group. Once triggered, the objects could then have dynamic batching enabled if applicable, along with physics, their scripts, sound, and so on. Switching topics to lighting for a minute. In my early experiments, I always worked with light maps. In the beginning, it produced great results. But as I scaled up, and because of the size of my scenes, it ended up meaning dozens of hours of big time, gigabytes of light map textures, and barely any noticeable enhancements to the visuals in the end. Totally not worth it. Since the skyscrapers in Mile High Taxi are supposed to be, well, at least a mile tall, not much sunlight would find its way into the city canyon walls anyways. So I could get rid of light mapping altogether and stick with just using light probes. There's really not that much variance of color in the Mile High City, so I haven't really needed that many light probes so far. This is more of a development time savings than runtime. And honestly, I'm not certain which of light probes or light mapping is more performant in my case, but I highly suspect it's light probes. Plus, they save me huge headaches. Another small performance boost was achieved by switching reflections on game objects from blended to simple instead. Given the speed of the player, there's no benefit to having reflection probes blended. This simple change saved me a few more fractions of a millisecond per frame. Since I'm currently CPU bound, it had a noticeable impact. Lastly for today, I'm working on a system to detect when specific game objects should be enabled and disabled. There's no need for all the buildings to be enabled if there's a guarantee they won't be visible at the player's current location. While I haven't implemented this system yet, I've already profiled the net result, and it's pretty significant. More than a 50% frame rate increase. Already, just a reminder, if you haven't already wishlisted Mile High Taxi on Steam, be sure to click the link down below. So, what do you guys think? In this video, I only covered a small amount of the performance optimizations I've already implemented, but do you think I can do them better? Would you be interested in hearing about some of the other optimizations I've done to reach 350 frames per second? Tell me in the comments below.
and be sure to subscribe for future updates.